appreciate you coming out and worship the Lord with us at Isabella Baptist Church. If you're a guest, visitor today, we're glad that you're here with us too. Uh, the beautiful flowers are placed in the church today by Jason Ben. We thank him for doing that for us uh, this morning. But I just continue to remember we have begun our season of prayer and giving for our North American missionaries through the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Our church goal is $3,000, and we'll be collecting this over the next several weeks. So please give uh, so that we can help our missionaries uh, share the love of Jesus right here on the continent that we live on. Uh, parents and grandparents, just remember this coming Saturday at 11 a.m. we'll be having our children Easter egg hunt here at the church. Lunch will be served. Every child needs to bring a, a dozen plastic eggs, and if you can still bring some candy donations in by this coming Wednesday, it will be uh, greatly appreciated. Also, continue to remember that the GAs are collecting these supplies, our supplies, crafts, puzzles, <coughs> colored crayons, colored pencils, journals, uh, things of that nature for the Children's Hospital in Macon. And they will be collecting these supplies through the rest of this month. So again, we got two boxes in the back. Uh, they're getting close to being full. And we appreciate those who have already given so that we can help these children as well as their families as they have their stay in the hospital. Also, we'll be having our sunrise service here at the church on Sunday, April the 4th at, at 7.30 in the morning. In the past, we started at 7, but we're going to uh, push it down a little bit to 7.30 so that we can see a little bit better outside. I am getting a little older, and I've noticed it's hard to read the Bible in the dark, and uh, it's hard to see you notes and things like that. And we will start at 7.30. We will have breakfast, and breakfast will already be prepackaged into go plates. That does not mean that you have to leave to eat breakfast. You're more than welcome uh, to stay here in the social hall, be set up, read eat your breakfast. But if you feel more comfortable grabbing that, uh, that breakfast and going home and eating it, we completely understand, and we're just trying to serve everyone. But in light of that, if, you, if you're going to stay for breakfast, we have a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board. So please sign up between now and then so that we'll know how much food to prepare. We want to have plenty, but we don't want to have overabundance and you know, waste and get uh, a lot of people are not going to eat breakfast. So please sign up for that if you're going to stay for breakfast. Also, on that same day, 11 o'clock, we will be having our worship service. Since we're having sunrise, we will not have Sunday school that morning. Our worship will begin at the same time at 11 a.m. Our choir has been practicing for several weeks now. They're going to be singing the Easter musical. And immediately following that, I will be preaching. And we hope that you can be with us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the, the premier day in all, in all the lives of Christians because Jesus is not in the tomb. Uh, he is alive forevermore. And we just remember what he did for us over 2,000 years ago. Uh, just, a, just a quick um, um, uh, announcement, and we'll start having this in the bulletin uh, in, in the weeks to come. Uh, we will be honoring our graduates this year, as we always do. We're probably going to be honoring them on the first Sunday in May. So if you're a high school graduate, technical school graduate, a college graduate, start seeing uh, Miss Abbott's letter know so we'll know how to prepare accordingly on that day.
copy of God's Word with you this morning. Turn back to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, the verses that we will look at this morning is 9 through 11. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. And the subject we'll be looking at this morning is the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. place? Say amen. amen. The Word of God says, therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what He has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are all well known to God, and I also trust are all well known in your consciousness. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you'll give us understanding this morning as we look into your word. Lord, we pray for the preaching of your word. We pray for your Holy Spirit to come and to accomplish through the preaching of your word what you desire to accomplish. Lord, we pray for life change in this place today. We pray for the lost to be saved. We pray for the children of God to leave with a better understanding of you, Lord, and a closer walk with you. Lord, we just want to worship you. We want to exalt you today. We just want to thank you for the good gift that you have given us, the great gift, the wonderful gift of your son, Jesus. But as we see here in this passage, Lord, those of us who believe we will be judged on the basis of what we have done with that gift after our conversion. So be with us this morning. Speak powerfully to us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. There are many employers that have evaluation forms. They use these forms to evaluate their staff or employees at their business. These forms basically give the employer two options for grading the individuals that work for them, satisfactory or unsatisfactory. If they get an unsatisfactory on the evaluation form, this may have profound ramifications because unsatisfactory means that they have not been performing at the best for their boss. It could mean that they not received the rating that they hoped for and it will be too late to change the rating when they sit down in the office to discuss their duties that they have performed or lack thereof on the job site. On the other hand, if an employee gets a satisfactory rating, that means that they have done their job well and that they're going to be recognized for going above and beyond the call of duty. So just like there are evaluations on earth, there is coming a day when God is going to take every Christian and He's going to evaluate them or rate them on what they have done here on this earth. Core belief principles, core biblical beliefs, that has been the focus of this year in this congregation. Getting back to the fundamentals of the Christian faith, the foundations on which we stand as believers. Again, we have looked at who our God is. We have looked and seen what true truth is or what biblical truth is. We have seen the need for the new birth. We recognize who we are in Jesus. We have looked at the amazing love that God has for us. The priceless treasure that we possess as believers. And that priceless treasure is Jesus inhabiting these clay pots of ours. We have looked and seen what it means to have a solid faith in Jesus. And last week, we looked at the assurance of our eternal hope that we have in Him. And today we're going to look at another important truth, the non-negotiable of the Christian faith. And that non-negotiable is this. Every believer, every child of God who has been washed in the blood of the Lamb will stand before the Lord one day at the judgment seat of Christ. So as we look at this subject this morning, I see Paul basically re reminding us or showing us two very important truths. 
Number one, as a church, as a body of believers, as those who have been saved by His grace, we need, to, we need to remember what our goal is. We need to remember what our goal is. Looking back to verse number nine, we see, therefore we make it our aim. Again, Paul begins this scripture with a very important connecting word, therefore. This word, therefore, once again, connects what Paul is saying currently to what he has previously stated. Like if we were to look back in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, we see the same word in verse 16. It says there, therefore we do not lose heart. Well, why don't we lose heart as believers? Well, the only way that you're going to find that answer is to go back up to verses 7 through 15. We don't lose heart because of the priceless treasure that we possess as believers. We have the eternal Lord Jesus Christ living in us when we repent of our sins and trust in His name. And now going back to the text at hand, Paul says, therefore, we make it our aim. Why do we have this aim? Why do we have this goal? Why do we have this target, so to speak, as believers? Well, if we're to know the answer to having this goal or this target in our life, we have to look back at the previous eight verses. And last week we looked at, we have an eternal home because of Jesus. We're going to have a brand new spanking body one of these days at the resurrection. Amen? Amen. We're going to have a glorified body. And we learn this in verse 5 that God Himself has done this. And He has promised this to each and every one of us. When we leave this world by death, we have this great promise above because of the Lord. And because of this great promise, because what He has accomplished for those that believe, we make this our aim. The word aim means to have a goal or to have ambition. Now we all know here this morning that some forms of ambition is very selfish. The word ambition can be rather worldly. The English word ambition comes from a Latin word, word, word that literally means to go around. And this word was used by the Romans in Paul's day to refer to politicians who went around politicking to get votes to be elected. That's what that word means. We see the same in our nation today. We have politicians who run for higher office, whether on the local, state, or national level. And they are running around trying to do what? Convince us to vote for them. And to convince us not to vote for their opponent. And many times, not all the time, but most of the time, these politicians are not seeking the good of others. They have their own ambitions. They have their own interests and goals in mind which are very selfish because when you run for higher office, you're not looking for uh, your own gain. You're looking after those that you're going to represent. So in some instances, ambition can be a poison to the soul. It can lead to pride. It can be lead to envy. It can cause someone to be very self-centered and self-seeking. It can drive people to seek wealth, power, and claim instead of seeking the Lord. And these are not a help to yourself or a help to others. So basically, ambition in a worldly sense will cause people to compromise their beliefs or compromise their convictions. But Paul is not using this word for aim or ambition in a negative sense. He's using it in a positive way or a biblical way. Again, he states, we make this our aim or we make this our ambition. Because of what Jesus has done for us, because of the gift of salvation we possess, what Paul is saying, it should lead the child of God to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Lord Wiersbe puts it like this, what we believe and how we behave must always go together. What we say we believe and how we behave must always go together. Another way of looking at it, correct teaching, correct biblical teaching and your duty are always together. What you see in God's Word is what we should be living out on a daily basis according 
to the Word of God. So if we truly know what God has done for us through His Son, what Paul is saying, it should motivate us, it should give us a holy ambition to do something for the Lord, to live a life that is going to bring Him honor and glory. So our goal, Paul says, as a believer, after we've been saved, is to live a life pleasing to Jesus. Our aim should be to please Jesus. Amen. Simply put, your life, my life, those of us who are saved in this house today, that sums up the Christian life. We aim to please Jesus. Amen. The word for please or pleasing here can be also translated acceptable. Our aim is to be acceptable in the sight of God. Paul says this in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you present your God, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, pleasing unto God, which is your reasonable service. The least you can do is to live a life pleasing to the Lord for what He has done for you and me. Paul lived this life. And he lived his life not in the view of what the human opinion thought of him. Paul lived his life after his conversion in view of what the Lord thought of him. And because he knew what the Lord did for him and what the Lord thought of him, this made him strive daily to live in a way to make much of Jesus. You see, our goal should not have changed today. Things have not changed. Our goal as believers... Our great ambition is to please Jesus. So we must ask, is the life that I'm currently living as a believer, is it pleasing to Him? I can only answer that for me. Only you can answer that for you. Is the life that I'm currently living pleasing to the Lord? To the children and youth in here, and what, and, and is what you're doing with your friends when your parents aren't watching is that pleasing to Jesus? Is what you're doing when your parents aren't watching, is that pleasing to the Lord? Is what you are doing with others when your husband or wife aren't doing or not around, is that pleasing to the Lord? Is what you and I are doing with our friends when we go out with them, is that bringing honor and glory to the name which is above every name? If the language that comes out of our mouth, which the Bible says stems from our heart, is the language that we speak, is it pleasing to Jesus? Is the way I view others, regardless of who they are, is that biblical and acceptable in the sight of God? How I view other people. How I treat it other people. You see, church, whether we realize it or not, everything we do or what we fail to do matters for all of eternity. And Paul wanted to live his life in such a way, he states here in verse 9, whether present, meaning if he's still home in the body, living on this earth, or absent, if he's in the presence of God for all of eternity, in light of what Jesus has done, his aim was to please him. Paul states in his first letter to the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians, he reminds the church there in that first letter, this life that you're living now as a believer, it's not your own. For you have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You see, the free gift that has been given to you Cost your Lord and Savior everything. And if He has redeemed you, you need to realize this life is not about you anymore. It's about Him and Him alone. And Paul said, that's your aim. So are we pleasing to the Lord? Or are we making a mockery out of what He has done for us? Are we living for Him? Or are we making a mockery out of what He has done for us? Again, it is your goal as a Christian to be totally devoted to Jesus. I want you to know, family and friends, this morning, it will show in your life if you are or not. And it matters greatly what you're doing with your life as a believer. And that's point number two. 
we see what we should be doing, what our aim should be, our goal should be. Our goal should be to please the Lord. And secondly, we're going to look at why it matters. Why does it matter after I'm saved if I live in a certain way or not? Paul begins verse number 10 with these words. For we must all appear. For we must all appear. The first word I take notice there is the word all. Now this all is not speaking for all of humanity. You've got to understand context. Who's Paul talking to? Paul's talking to the church. He's talking to the redeemed. He's speaking to those who are Christians, those who have been saved. The lost will have their time in the court of God. But it's not this court. This is the time for the believer. The next word we see is the word of Peter. All Christians will appear. Have you ever got a summons to be in court here on earth? It's okay. We're not going to judge you. You had to go to court because you broke the law. Be honest. But we all know what that is. You get a piece of paper in the mail, you've been summoned. We're just saying it's for jury duty. You have to show up for court on what? That specified date on that paper. You're demanded by law to what? Appear. In the court of God, every believer is going to appear one day. The word appear does mean to be present. But that word in the original language speaks more of just being present. That word also means to be made manifest or to reveal. Philip Hughes comments, to be made manifest means not to just appear, but to be laid bare. Stripped of every outward facade of respectability and openly revealed in the full and true reality of one's character. So what's Philip and Paul say? One day we will appear before the Lord. But, it's more than that. The full truth about the lives we live or didn't live will be made clear. Our character, our integrity, or lack thereof will come up at the judgment seat of Christ. Basically this, you and I will truly see at the judgment seat of Christ what the Lord thought of the lives that we lived after our salvation. What we did with the gift, the free gift that has been given to us. You remember what God told Samuel? Man looks at the hour, but God looks at the, the heart. The writer of Hebrews says, we are all naked before him and we must give an account. And we will give an account for with what we did with Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ for what some scholars call the Bema seat of Jesus. The Bema was a lifted up platform in Greek culture. And in Greek towns they were judgment seats in which appropriate officials would sit above the people and render judgment. These Bema seats were also used in Greek culture for the winners to be given awards during the ancient Olympic Games. But Paul uses this terminology of something that people he's writing about would know to point to the fact that there's one who is sitting on the throne, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said all authority has been given to him. All judgment will be rendered by Jesus. And this Jesus is sitting on his beam of seat and at this Bema seat is the court that you and I as believers will go to give an account for the life that we live or didn't live for the glory of God. Now at this judgment, this is not a judgment in a sense where our sins are going to be dealt with. As a believer, your sins were dealt with. Turn about a cross. Judicially speaking, when you get saved, your sins were taken care of when you were washed by the blood of the Lamb. Paul 
states in Romans 8 and 1, if you're in Christ, there is now no condemnation. Because Christ took the penalty for your sin and you're justified before God forevermore. John 8, Jesus said, the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Well, Pastor, if it's not for our sin, what are we being judged for? Again, the life that we are living for the Lord. He says here, but we must all appear, the, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body. What we did with our bodies, or what we did for the Lord, or didn't do for the Lord, according to what we or He has done, whether what, good or bad. Yes, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. But again, it is vitally important to know that yes, we have been saved, but after we are saved, we are saved unto good works. We have been grafted into the vine, and if we have been grafted into the vine, we ought to be doing what? Producing fruit for the honor and glory of God. So the simplest way of putting it is this. After you and I were saved, if we begin to pursue the Lord with the life that we live, then your life for the Lord was good. If you're walking with Jesus, you're pursuing Him, trying to use everything in your life to glorify Him, your life will be looked at as good. But after you were saved, and you still want to live your life by your own ways, your own rules, your work for the Lord then will be judged differently. And notice there's no gray area here, is there? It's either going to be good or bad. He's going to deem our service for Him as either useful or useless. Work while or it's been worthless. In church, we will give an account. It will be a day of reckoning for those who belong to the Lord. The judgment seat of Christ will either be a great day of reward for the believer, a time of great rejoicing, but for the believer who lived their life in a way that is not pleasing to the Lord, it will be a day in which rewards could be lost. How do we know this? 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 11, states, For no other foundation can anyone lay that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, that's the foundation we build on, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it. What day? This day. The judgment seat of Christ. Because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work in what sort it is. If anyone's work which has been built, it endures, they will receive rewards. If anyone's work is firm, he will do what? Suffer loss. But he himself will be saved. Why? Because this is not your judicial standard. This has to do with your service. Yet so is fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Paul's saying the same thing in two different places in the Bible. Paul says we have the foundation, our salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we get to build upon that foundation, God. The thing is, Paul uses some imagery here. Gold, silver, precious stones. When you put them in fire, them precious stones, they came out what? They come out purified. Don't they? they don't get burned up by the fire. But if you, that, that's saying you're living your life for the utmost for the glory of God. But on the flip side, if you're building your life on wood, hay, and straw, will they survive fire? Will they survive judgment? Survive judgment? The Bible is saying, no. There are going to be those 
who receive many rewards one day, and there are going to be those who are Christians that are going to suffer loss one day. Again, this has nothing to do with you getting into heaven or being rejected out of heaven. This has to do with what you did with your life for Jesus once you were saved. And the rewards are like thereof you'll receive. That's why it's important for us as believers to live every day for the glory of God. Because He is keeping a record. God will judge me one day for how I've passed it. God will judge me one day for how I've preached. How I've taught His Word. How I've led this congregation. He will judge me for that. Just as He'll judge your individual life for what you have done for Him. It don't have nothing to do with being called to be a preacher, not being called for preacher. It's just like it's just living your life for Jesus. This is all this is about. It's not about title. Well, it's got one title. It's about the title just being a servant. At the end of the day, it's not your job to please everybody around you. At the end of the day, your job to please Jesus. And that's why Paul concludes this section in verse 11. Because of the terror or the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. The fear of God, the terror of the Lord has to do with reverence, all respect of Him. And when we truly have a proper respect and reverence for the Lord, this leads to our worship of Him, our adoration of Him, our love for Him, but it also leads to our service, the life that we live under. And since we know that we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, we as believers persuade and encourage one another to live our lives worthy of the one who died for us. Again, we're not. This, ain't have, this does not have anything with redeeming the lost, but we have a lot to do with that. But again, what Paul is using the context here, we as believers, we should be encouraging one another to do what? Each other to live our best for Jesus Christ. Why? Because of the terror of the Lord. Because one day we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Unbelievers will stand at the great white throne judgment. You don't want to be there. But at this judgment, we will give an account again for what we've done or what we have not done for our world. My point of this message is this. I hope that you see being saved is vitally important. It's internally important. It's the greatest decision that you've ever made. But there's more to being saved than just being saved. You're saved unto something. Once you're saved, you have a great purpose. And that purpose is to please God with every fiber of your being. That should be our aim. That should be our goal. That should be our ambition. So on the day of judgment, when it is revealed, we will hear the great words. Well done. God will not say well done unless it's well done. But at the judgment seat, it will reveal how seriously we took our aim or if we were negligent with our aim. And the purpose that God has given us. Ephesians 2.8. We've been saved by grace. But Ephesians 2.10. We've been saved unto good works. We are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. For good works. You've been saved. To live your life in such a way. That they know that you belong to Jesus. All Christians bear two relationships to God. They bear a family relationship. When you're saved, you automatically become a child of God. But you also bear a relationship of service. At the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be there because you belong to God as a child. Again, unbelievers will not be here. You're going to be at that judgment because you are a child. But he's not going to judge you for being a child. 
He's going to judge you as a child for how you honor his son as a servant. Let me close with this illustration. If a person wants to be a doctor, they don't wake up one day and say, I want to be a doctor and then start practicing. That decision to be a doctor is usually made years in advance and that decision will determine what grades they need to make as well as what university they need to attend. In other words, a person does not become a doctor the day they decide they want to pursue medicine. That decision requires a process. Some of us in here have retirement accounts, 401ks or IRA because we're planning for 65 and beyond. You don't wake up at the age of 64 and say, let me start planning for retirement. You will never retire. That decision is made years in advance, so when, the 50, when 65 arrives, you have something laid aside. The point is, the knowledge of the future should control the activity of the present. When you know where you are going, you will make decisions about what you must do in the now. There is a day of reckoning coming when every Christian is going to give an account. And when that day comes, it will be too late to make any adjustments. Your decision about that meeting, that day of reckoning in which you and I are going to be at, where we're going to meet Jesus, will have to be made long in advance of that occasion. In the words of Jim Elliott, the famous missionary, he is no fool to give up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. So pastor, if I've not been living my life for the Lord, what can I do? You start now. God's still gracious. You can start right now living your life for Jesus. So again, during this invitation, you need to ask yourself a personal question. What's your goal in life? What's your ambition as a believer? Again, judicially, it's been taken care of. you got a home in heaven. He's prepared a place for you. But salvation is so much more than that. Salvation is so much more than just heaven in this church. And that's what some of us just treat salvation as. I ain't going to hell, I'm going to heaven. That's all that matters. There's more to it than that. Jesus just didn't save you so you could go to heaven. Jesus saved you so you can make a difference in this earth while you're here. Pastor, you mean to tell me little old me can make a difference? Yeah, even a little pebble makes a ripple in a pond. Yes, you can make a great difference for the kingdom of God here on this earth. And you can be rewarded for it. You will be rewarded for it one day if you live for Jesus with all that you have. You just come up here and clean out the trash out of the bathroom or clean up during Bible school. You give it all for the glory of God. If you're a prayer warrior for this church, you give it all for the glory of God. I should have said earlier, there's more to the Christian life than just sitting in that pew. And it will be revealed if we just sat in a pew one day before we the life of service. Father, we do thank you for this day. Thank you for this message, Lord. Thank you for giving me on this message so I can see ways, Lord, that are not pleasing to you in my own life, Lord, that I can improve on. But, Lord, it should be our aim. We, we don't do it out of guilt. We don't do it out of you coercing us to do it. We just simply want to do this, make this our aim out of our love and our adoration for what you have done for us. So Lord, I pray as we leave this place today that each and every heart that is a believer will have their minds made up beyond any shadow of doubt that they're going to make it their aim, they're going to make it their goal, they're going to make it their target, their ambition to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who gave His life for them on Calvary Seal. But Lord, there may be somebody here today, Lord, they haven't even started this walk with you. And I pray, Lord, at the sound of my voice, they can begin that start today. They can begin getting judicially right with you by surrendering their life to Jesus Christ. And Lord, those that you save, you do save forevermore. And you will save them and use them for your kingdom's work here on this earth. So Father, just use this invitation to draw people closer to your side. And I pray this in Jesus' name.
Thank you.